you know, how do you explain to your husband you're having these crazy thoughts that you can't go back to work? I simply knew when I started addressing what was happening that I, I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to be able to do it anymore. I was going to have to stop and I was going to have to change something fairly dramatically. It was like a wave came over me and I just lost control of myself and I just came in, came in sat down and burst into tears. You feel that you have no choice. So you put on the acting face and you go in there as if everything's wonderful. And underneath is just nothing but a very, very runny, wobbly jelly. There was no reason for me to get up in the morning. There was no value in what I was doing. And therefore, Dead seemed like a very good option. Stress is on the increase, affecting over a fifth of the working population. This is the story of five professionals who were pushed to the limit by the pressure of work. You can imagine the demands of modern life. Nowadays, people are expected to work at a much faster pace. There are many, many jobs that people are trained for but not allowed to do so people aren't fulfilling their full skill potentials if you like. Um, social support at work and social support generally society is changing those kind of things are breaking down all of these lead to people actually suffering more stress and eventually starts moving on to more illness. In Britain work is the third most common cause of stress after bereavement and financial worries. Employers lose nearly 7 million working days each year to stress-related illnesses. Yet many people are unaware that their complaints are symptomatic of stress. I wanted to be a social worker from the time I was 15. I chose my A-levels on the basis of wanting to be a social worker. Being a basic grade social worker was enough. I was expected to become an accountant, a housekeeper, a home care manager, an assessor for people. Having to play so many different roles within a very short period of time, having those roles changed without proper guidance, without proper training, is exhausting. It's exhausting emotionally, it's exhausting physically. And at the end of the day, you burn out. I burned out. After a particularly traumatic visit to a client's house, I found my hands and my feet covered in eczema, which I've not suffered from since I was 10 years old or something. And when I say covered, I mean they were absolutely covered. So I went to the doctors and explained what had happened and he said you're not going back and that was it and it was as simple as that linda was told to take time off but after six months bored and restless she was determined to go back to work i think she was hoping that she'd put the past few months behind her that she'd be able to return to work and obviously return to work be stable not be ill um, and she was upbeat, she was bubbly, effervescent, um, and I felt, fingers crossed, things should go well for her. I'd led quite a sheltered life, I'd gone to a nice school, and to suddenly go from that, having expected to go into farming or something like that, to go into London, where it was all sort of high fly and posh cars and whining and dining at night, I mean, it was, it was a bit glamorous, I suppose. Because you're used to earning quite a lot of money, it's very hard to suddenly not have that money or to expect you won't have that, that sort of money. So it was, it, was, it, was, um, it was one of the sort of jobs where you could never leave it until it decided to leave you, I think. From above you're getting perform, 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 targets, targets, targets. And I think you've got to be a very special kind of person to cope with that, and I don't think most of us can. I remember when I first joined the company, you know, we used to go out for an hour and a half lunches and meet clients and have a great time. And towards the end, 
we actually had sort of no lunch at all. We got sandwiches in and just worked all the way through. If you read any articles from anywhere, everybody thinks you're at your optimum efficiency for sort of six hours, maybe eight. So when you're working 12 or 14, there's a huge tail off. Your efficiency from being okay doesn't just sort of gently go down, it goes vroom. So you're making more mistakes. You're making more mistakes because you're more tired. You're then worried about making more mistakes and there you are. And it just sort of catches up on itself and gets faster and faster. And you know, long hours do not work. Decisions up in London are instantaneous. And on the one push of a calculator, if you've got a decimal point in the wrong place, you've probably done a deal and lost. It could be 200,000 pounds. I mean, huge money just on one press of one button. Um, and that, again, cannot be good for you. I mean, it's, it's, everything is just, it just, everything is tension. Everything is stress and speed. It was all I could do to make myself get out of bed, to face what I knew was inevitably going to happen that day. And yet it is the instinct. It's something, again, you come back to it. It's something you've done for 23 years. You feel that you have no choice. So you put on the acting face and you go in there as if everything's wonderful. And underneath is just nothing but a very, very runny, wobbly jelly. But you don't realise what the cumulative effect is having in the body and in the mind probably is more important. You used to get home at night and go to sleep and you'd wake up absolutely dripping wet with sweat of fear. Um, and when you're in the job, it was just a constant sort of a great lump in the sort of top of the chest there, which you were just sort of... I suppose you got used to it. You actually forgot it was there, but if you did sit and think, it was certainly there like a huge, great lump in the middle. And it's very difficult to cope with. It, it was the relationship, I think, with, with the pupils that, that made the job, that you had these young people and you could influence them, you could inspire them in your subject. It was the juggling of, you know, so many different balls, so many different responsibilities, so many new initiatives um, in schools. And a, a school that is successful wants to keep improving. And that, I felt, increased the pressure on all staff and senior staff. So on top of all your daily responsibilities, there would be new things to look at, and new things to implement. I have wonderful parents, but they're, they're quite academic, they're very successful. Dad's been a successful head teacher, you know, for, I don't know, 30 years. My mother is, um, is a mental health commissioner, she's been a JP, she's, you know, done work at Cambridge University. So it's a very high powered, very clever. Um, and I couldn't believe that these people could love somebody who wasn't successful. Therefore, I had to be successful. I had to be, you know, I had to be really good at what I did. The first blip, I think my doctor would call it depression initially, happened that the May after I'd started the new job in January. And I think that was almost sheer exhaustion of all that change and of trying to get up to full speed when I, I, I didn't know the people I was working with. I, was, I didn't know the systems in this new school and yet I expected myself to perform brilliantly from the word go. Eleanor had pushed herself too hard. She was prescribed antidepressants and sought long-term counselling. Not recognising the severity of her situation, she was back at work within a week. I didn't think anything was different, except there was this scary idea that this could happen. But it, you know, it was only like a little blip. And continued then in my job, working hard, taking on more responsibility and so on. In many ways, when I think back about it now, the lifestyle was great. Um, it was very boozy which suited me down to the ground. I knew, you know, hundreds of people from the various departments that I'd worked in. And so the local bars around that area, if I walked into any of them, I'd know enough people to go and have a beer with.
the culture of, of um, the office in the company that I worked for was people were there pretty well from dawn till dusk, if not before and after. Um, and you're sat there, you know, in front of a bank of five computer screens, relaying you news and information and share prices from all over the world. You are sat in a chair with your feet up on the desk and a telephone hanging off your shoulder for 12 hours a day. The principal stresses involved in that type of work is the feeling of being permanently evaluated and the sort of competitive edge. And, and if you suddenly found that you were sort of falling behind in one way or another, you know, that's quite an unpleasant feeling if everyone else around you is doing better in terms of the amount of business that they're generating or the amount of money that they're making or whatever it be. It was stressful. I mean, many people are well suited to it and, and they perhaps enjoy the stress or they just don't get stressed. But I, I found being permanently analysed and permanently feeling that I had to succeed at, at what I was doing and I had to try and be better than the next person or as good as the next person. Very difficult. I felt a physical pain in my chest a lot of the time. That awful sinking feeling you have when you realise, you know, and you get in your car and you, you're driving off on holiday and you realise you've left the stove on. That sort of, <gasps> God, you know, oh, what have I done? And you have to, whatever, you know, those types of things. That's how I felt a lot of the time. Um, you know, butterflies in your stomach. And, and I definitely felt often quite uncomfortable in my chest. In fact, I, I, I went to... Um, have a couple of medicals and they sort of warned me about that. My liver wasn't working as well as it should do probably because I was just boozing too much. Um, I, I don't think I was boozing because I wanted to get away from stress but it was a part of the lifestyle that you go out and have a few beers. And so I, I definitely felt that my health was suffering. It was suffering, it's on paper, I mean it was, it was a real thing. My, my family noticed it, and I think my friends noticed it too. I, I certainly wasn't happy with what I was doing, and it, and it showed, or it began to show more and more. Um, I certainly wasn't healthy, and I think if I had continued, you know, it would have probably got worse. My biggest love is being out in the fresh air. Uh, I've always been a dairy farmer. I don't know that I would want to be an arable farmer on a, with all the tractor work and such. On dairy farm, there's, there's quite a lot of variety. You never think it's going to be you, and I never thought it was going to be me. I, I didn't think I'd got any big problems. Uh, we were financially stable. I'd got a good marriage. My family were fine. I'd got the best staff. I could ever hope for on the place. I got friends. Every, I thought everything was fine. I did, I did anyway. Stress caught Lynn completely unawares. He ran his award-winning dairy herd supported by his wife and two children. Lynn's long hours and dedication were to bring about his downfall. Farming is a 24-hour day thing. His day began at four o'clock and it finished about nine in the evening usually. Obviously he came in for coffee and came in for lunch, but it was relentless. He was very stressed and didn't have time to go walking and all the things we'd started to do, he was making excuses not to do because farm work came first again. Jill used to say, she said I was getting too fussy. Um, if I had an idea, it had to be done there and then, even if it was halfway through a meal, things like this. But, I don't, as I say, I don't know whether anyone else noticed anything about me. Often people pinpoint a nervous breakdown to one particular event. As a clinician, when I look at people, you find that they've brought loads and loads of problems with them that have been building up to that point, and what they're saying is the particular event is one particular precipitating event that everyone latches onto. Often that is the thing that pushes them just that little bit over the edge, but it's like the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's rare that that one event has caused everything. Eleanor struggled on at her new school for two years. But the burden of her workload finally became too much. I don't know why it happened that day. I don't think there was anything significant about what happened the day that I, my engine broke down. 
you know, it. I think it was just a fa the fact that I had this time completely run out of steam. It was a Friday, and I can't remember anything particular about the morning. I probably did some teaching. But I remember I was quite worried about <coughs> a meeting in the afternoon. We had a working committee on learning styles. And I remember saying to my colleague, I feel this is the straw that's you know, going to break the camel's back. That it was for me, I felt involvement in this additional committee was just one thing too much was with the head and myself and a number of other staff and I just remember thinking to myself I'm not coping with this I'm just I'm not coping um, with this situation at all and at one stage I asked to be to be excused and went to the loo and cried and uh, I didn't know what was happening I can't remember the, the journey home. I used to remember the feeling of relief at, at leaving work and it wasn't just, oh, that's another day over, I can go home to whatever. But it, it was like, it, it was like this armour had been there and you were having to hold this armour up all day. And then you could be you. You could, you could get in the car and you could be you. Don't ask me why I couldn't be me in my work. Um, and just that relief, but uh, yes, and, and and coming home, and you know, how do you explain to your husband you're ha having these crazy thoughts that you can't go back to work? You know, you're just such a wreck. Um, you're so collapsed inside. It is. It's a feeling of collapse. It's that you've no more strength. You can't do it anymore. Like Eleanor, Simon tried to conceal the stress he was feeling for years, but he too was delaying the inevitable. I was very snappy, very short-tempered. My children, who I love dearly, I'm sure must have hated me at times because I sort of didn't want to do anything with them, didn't want to go out, I just wanted to sit and chill out. So that all starts to add to the stress all the way through and it just becomes a cumulative effect until something's got to give and there's a dirty great bang and it all goes wrong. I think the day that it all finally went wrong and all the sort of pigeons came home to roost as it were was when I went up in the train, I got on the train, I wasn't feeling good when I got up in the morning, I was feeling very stressed about a couple of situations that I knew I had ongoing from the day before. And I sort of was sort of clammy and a bit grey and sweating and unpleasant. So I got halfway to work, I'd blacked out on the train, I got off the train to come home so I thought this just isn't right. Um, and British Rail, bless their cotton socks, were absolutely stunning, which was amazing. They don't often get praised, but I got back on the train at Clapham Junction to come home. I said to the chap next to me, look, I don't feel particularly good, you know, I'm not going to do anything horrible like throw up all over you, but I'm not feeling right. Uh, I did black out, and when I came to, there's a guard sitting next to me and um, they'd actually called an ambulance that was waiting at Sutton Station to sort of whip, whip me off the train. And then I got tested and they thought I'd had a heart attack. And it was just stress, it was just, a, you know, I think they called it, what they call it, executive burnout or something. The hospital in Sutton, because I was very twitchy anyway, the hospital in Sutton was just like a, it was just a scary place to be. So I signed myself out of that and they got very upset when I signed myself out of there. Got a taxi home rang my wife and said, I'm coming home because it's all gone horribly wrong, blah, blah, blah. She'd obviously completely flipped her lid because she thought I was signing out of hospital and I was having a heart attack and all this sort of thing. So I got back here, at which point the family doctor was standing in the kitchen and as I walked through the door behind me, I just was sort of confronted by my family doctor who then gave me the lecture of a lifetime. How dare I sign myself out of hospital? How dare I come back? And it's like all these things. I think when things are going wrong, there's only one place you want to be and that's home. For Lynn the farmer, home and work were inseparable, and the pressures became inescapable. It happened in October, which is quite a busy time of the year. I'd gone to another farm to pick up some bags of feed, and uh, I intended to pick up ten bags of feed.
And when I got back here, I found I'd only got eight. And that seemed to um, tip me over the edge. He said, I can't even count to ten or something silly. And I said, well, everybody makes mistakes, like you would say. But he's always thought everything's his fault if it goes wrong, which of course it isn't. And he just sat down over there and he said, I just can't cope any longer. And burst into tears and um, I said something like, um, you know, don't worry. And he said, oh, I've been feeling like this for ages. It was like a wave came over me and I just lost control of myself. And I just came in, came in sat down and burst into tears. I really didn't know what to do. And we talked about him going to the doctor and he said, no, I'll be right in a minute. He went straight upstairs to bed and was and did sleep actually straight away for ages, but I had I had got him to say he'd go to the doctor because I felt I couldn't phone without his permission then anyway, and so I did phone and so I was quite tearful on the phone to the receptionist and she was brilliant and said oh uh, don't worry you know we'll fit him in and everything. I then I actually went and cried all over him as well, which uh, wasn't very nice, but at least. Uh, it shows that showed I wasn't myself. After eight weeks back in her job, with long days of meetings and home visits, Linda was feeling pressurised again. Because I had had time off sick, I was subject to very close personal supervision. So although I had, you know... <laughs> tens of years of experience under my belt, whatever I was doing was being very closely scrutinised. I had tried to sort out a situation within the hospital so that a gentleman would be able to leave and in fact go to a nursing home. That gentleman should have left the hospital before I went on holiday. Um, when I returned from my holiday, he was still in the hospital because of bureaucratic difficulties within the two systems, between the social services and health authority. At that point, I knew I couldn't do this anymore. That, that really was it. Enough was enough. If I couldn't get somebody out of the hospital who'd been in there for months at a cost of seven, eight hundred pounds a week for the sake of less than a hundred pounds a week worth of plastic tubing. Then I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, I really did feel as though I couldn't achieve anything. That, that was absolutely it. Depression is a spectrum ranging from the mild depression, which is almost like severe stress, all the way up to such a severe illness that people stop eating, they stop talking, they virtually stop thinking and suicide is often one of the ultimate ends of depression. About five to ten percent of people with severe recurrent depression will kill themselves. My memory serves me right, I had a row with my kids, um, had a row with my partner and generally felt that there was no reason for me to get up in the morning there was no value in what I was doing. And therefore, dead seemed like a very good option. So dead was what I aimed for. I had a large quantity of paracetamol and a bottle of brandy. And after everybody had gone to bed, I made myself a bed up in the lounge. And then drank the brandy and ate the paracetamol. And woke up a day later in the local hospital full of tubes and bits and pieces and was very, very cross. What I really wanted to be was in my nice little black hole. Well, I wasn't in my nice little black hole, I was in a hospital room. So I was furious, absolutely furious. When you when you arrive at that sort of point in your life, and it's not talking you want, it's action. You want it to stop. And dead is the only real way that you can stop because what you're stopping 
is the experiences. It's life. You don't want to talk about it. I, you know, I'd done the counselling bit and all the rest of it. You, know, you don't want to keep repeating it. <laughs> no point. <laughs> so it's dead. Dead is it. You know that the the Sunday night feeling that people get, where you know oh, tomorrow's Monday. I noticed that something alarm bells started ringing for me when I noticed that actually earlier in the weekend, perhaps after a year of doing the last job that I had, um, Saturday I would be starting to think, oh God, Sunday, and then it's Monday again. And really, by the end, um, by the last year that I was there, I, I had a sort of feeling of joy on a Friday night that the week was over and almost instantly still the same evening almost in the same breath thinking oh god two days and I'm back here again and you I mean that's quite serious I mean when you really think about that you can't carry on doing doing that job you just can't it doesn't make sense ironically it was as I was starting to earn more money bonuses became quite exciting and and what have you that that was when I, it really triggered in my mind that, that I had to get out. And lots of people laugh at me about that because it seems kind of weird as you start to earn good money. But I knew that as soon as I got used to that good salary and good bonus, then you're on your career track and you can't escape or, or it becomes harder and harder and harder to escape. With his health deteriorating and under a lot of stress, it was time to get out or face a possible snap. An opportunity arose when our company was bought by another company. So I spoke to my boss and asked him what he thought um, was going to happen. And he said, to be honest, I don't think many of us will survive this. And I, you know, went like this and I thought, oh, great, you know, this is what I've always wanted. I'll get voluntary redundancy, I'll get redundancy. I can, you know, leave and, and uh, get paid to leave and then start with whatever else I feel like starting with. The next day I came in and there was a big sign saying everybody from this department should go to the personnel department. And I thought, you know, this is great, this is it, this is it. And I went to my desk to take my coat off and there were some new business cards with my name on at my desk. And my heart again just sank and I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm still here, I'm still here. And I just couldn't, almost couldn't face it. So I went upstairs and to the personnel department and there was greeted by somebody who, who said, I'm afraid, you know, you're going to who made redundancy and you have to leave now and, uh, you know, go through the exit uh, interview and what have you. And I was just grinning from ear to ear. It was one of the best days of my life. Um, it was really wonderful. The worst days, he sat just there in the chair, staring at the carpet with his hands on his knees. I think that was the worst time. You know, he wasn't doing anything or saying anything. And I couldn't say anything that could possibly help. I just felt useless. Um, my self-esteem was had gone. Um, yeah, useless, a, fa a failure. That's how I felt. A dreadful word. It's not. We don't mention it now. I was really frightened as days went on because I didn't know how bad it was going to be, and especially as he began to go a bit downhill to start with. I did have a psychiatric nurse come around and that that did work very very well because somehow you can talk sometimes talk to someone you don't know better than people you know I did keep a diary after January or so so as I could um, see how I was progressing but I think the, the couple of months before that I, I haven't got much recollection of at all I said to Jill, what a pity I didn't keep an account of the journey back. But who wants to read about carpet staring and worry beads? Karen, the community nurse, came in the afternoon. Says I'm doing nicely. Going to give one more visit, then says we'll see how I go. I told her that I felt that I now hadn't got quite so much to talk about, and that I felt that in itself was a good sign, and she agreed. Lynn's recovery has been slow, with many setbacks, but with the help of counselling and medication, he is overcoming his depression. Yeah, race, race, I thought.
after Linda's suicide attempt, out of immediate danger, she was admitted to a local psychiatric hospital. That was a, a useful space. It was a useful time because it gave me time to not be with people. They actually allowed me to be on my own until I was ready to start meeting with other people. After 10 weeks, Linda was discharged and sent home on medication. I think the, the whole experience, I think, has been really very damaging for the children. Um, they've both been quite traumatised by it. Knowing that what your mother is saying in terms of behaviour is, I'm leaving you, is incredibly difficult to deal with emotionally. And although it was two years ago now, and they, they both are, I think suspicious is probably a good word. You know, when I come home, will she actually be there? If she's not there, why isn't she there? If she is there, is she going to be sprawled out somewhere having taken another massive overdose because she wants to die? They don't know. It, it's destabilised a great part of their life, I think. For Linda, the effects of stress were so severe that the family was unable to cope. She and her partner eventually separated. Simon's way of dealing with such emotional turmoil was to blank it from his mind. To be honest, the, the immediate time after all this had happened, I can't remember that clearly. I think the brain just shuts down. It doesn't want you to think about it afterwards. All I know is everything was horrendous. I mean, the doctor tried to get me into all sorts of psychologists and psychiatrists and whatever, and I mean, I hadn't got a lot of time for them, to be honest. Certainly for me, they didn't do the right things. You know, the antidepressants went on for a long, long time, and I never really know whether they helped. Um, I just was too scared to come off them in case they were helping, so I stayed on those, I think it was about two or three years, which is a long time, scaling the dose down after scaling it up and moving from one to another. I think they said I should have six months off. And, you know, I went to my boss and said, I've got to have six months off, at which there was just, you know, forget it. You know, you can have a couple of weeks if you need it. But that's it, so that's more stress. Don't try and move it at all. We'll leave Simon now. was only we'll allowed three weeks minutes. off before yep. he was forced yep, back to work. Without time okay. to recover, he okay. failed to cope Thanks. and was eventually dismissed. This is a job you've done for 23 years. You can't just stop doing it. it. It doesn't become, it's not possible. You can't think it's possible. And it's not until somebody makes you do it by saying bye bye Simon, that you have to do it. And I must admit the day it actually happened, although I knew it was coming the day before, you sort of building up to it. It's all still horrible. But the day they've actually said, okay, that's it. You, you're out of here. You actually feel sort of the weight. You, I'm sure I gained about three inches in height. I sort of went, uh, Sam, Sam, steady. But I had to, for me, pretend that everything was great. And it wasn't great by any stretch of the imagination. And I mean, it caused stress on every part of my personal life to such a degree that in the end, my wife and I separated. I feel great guilt towards both my wife and particularly my children, who at that uh, time in my life, they were about sort of 14 and 12. And that's a very important time for them. And they obviously saw a dad who was totally unstable up and down like a yo-yo and bad temper some minutes, not here a lot of the time. And that's a guilt that you just got to live with. Sadly, you can't do anything about it. You can try to make it up to them, and I've tried to since. But it's how big the scar is in them, I don't know. How they'll cope with it, I don't know. They seem to be coping with it very well. Um, and it's something I will always regret. I suppose guilt, regret, the same sort of thing, that you can't turn the clock back and do it again. Five days after Eleanor's breakdown, Come she was on, already Auntie looking Beth. for a new challenge to occupy her time. I almost felt that if I, if I stayed on the sick, that I, I wouldn't get up again. There was that real fear. And it was probably fear of this fear, fear of failure again. I had failed, but I wasn't going to stay there. 
we have quite a large house, so I started talking to Alan about, you know, could we do something like Ben Breakfast? And he was quite opposed to start with. Eleanor's pattern was when she felt uncomfortable feelings, like being vulnerable, being scared, being scared that she was actually going to fail. Her way of being was just to launch herself into work and work so hard that she didn't have to feel anything. So all she was doing, really, from my point of view, was repeating her old pattern. To start with, I found it very, very stressful. I mean, the first two guests I had um, were very, very difficult. It's been part of the learning process for me just to you know, to learn to accept that this is not the Hilton and it's not five star, it's our home and it's, it's an interesting experience. When bookings were up, Eleanor was really high. When bookings were down, then it was the end of the world for her. And she'd come and she'd talk about her business and what she was doing. And so I was able to say to her, well, I wonder... Do you realise how strongly you're allying yourself with your business? Is there another way of, of stepping back and, and developing a life of your own so that you're not only defined by your work? Justin too has found a new line of work, swapping the desk and computer for a workbench, a grinder, and a new life as a builder. I've always had a thing about property, um, and I've always had a thing about doing things with my hands which is the one thing other than punching numbers into a calculator or into a keyboard on a computer, uh, the one thing that you don't do in banking. And also, I have a small element of creativity, I like to think anyway, um, and it's nice to be able to employ that a bit um, in, in my work. As time went on and I was umming and ahhing and thinking about what I would be best suited to, uh, opportunities came up for me to do odds and sods of work for friends and it really just started from there um, and as soon as I'd got into it then when I met uh, David my business partner who has been in this business for much longer than I have he was able to point me in the right direction a bit and it's a, it's a, a very different lifestyle but it suits me very well The one thing which, you know, inevitably you suffer from when you make a decision like, like the one I made is money. I mean, that's, the, that's everybody's principal concern, I think, probably, is money. You know, where's the, the next mortgage payment going to come from? Well, luckily for me, I got paid to leave. So I, I got a certain amount of money, which has provided a, a cushion for me to move into a much lower scale of pay. The first job that I did when I started working for myself was a tiny amount of money. Um, I did a little bit of work for a friend of mine. But that felt more real than any money that I'd ever earned before. This is real money. It was cash or it wasn't. It was a cheque. But, you know, I'd actually physically earned it. I hadn't sat at a desk, had a good month or a bad month or whatever, and just received a, you know, a salary paid straight into my account. You know, I'd had to physically work for it. And that was great. As you get older and you start to have children, then there are implications about whether you can afford to raise them and whether you can afford to educate them in the way that you would hope to do. And those are obviously big financial issues and those are concerns that I do have now. But um, I'm confident that I'll conquer them one way or another. And I want six children, so <laughs> I've got to do something pretty well. About 10 years before I actually left the job, I started the charity that I now run, which is Wildlife Aid, and I was sort of, that was my relaxation. I'd come home in the evenings and work with the charity till sort of one o'clock in the morning, or do rescues and work all weekends, but I needed the adrenaline to keep going, so that's why I did that. But as soon as I left work, then I just took on this full time. What are those badgers, Sambo? I come home to my those roots badgers. now. This is what I always wanted to do. I dreamt about it, and I'm oh, doing it. Yeah and every morning I get up and I actually quite look forward to it and even when the phone rings at two o'clock in the morning and somebody says I've run over a badger or something although it's a horrible thing to do I know I can do something about it I know I can make something better and I love doing it Wildlife Aid is a double whammy for me because I love animals and I think they're probably animals pets or whatever are the best anti-stress machine you'll ever get in the world 
Um, I don't know how many people's lives they've saved, but I should think millions upon millions. Having taken so long and earned big money, and sort of done everything I wanted to do, had better lifestyle than most, I can now put something back. The most disgusting badger in Surrey. Don't bite, Daddy, because it'll really If I get fed up with it here, I can wander around the garden, I can go and stroke a badger, I can go and do anything I want. And that's the difference when you're being controlled by other people and you have no choice in what you do, that's where the stress becomes unmanageable. Here, if I don't like it, in a way it might be an ego, but it's mine. So I can get up, walk away, and come back in quarter an hour's time, feel a hell of a lot better. What? There's lots of nosh in there, Dad. Six months on, Lynn is still on medication, but he is making a marked recovery with Jill's help. He couldn't have gone on like he was, getting faster and faster, more and more fussy, more and more worried. I couldn't see how, he kept saying he was going to step back from the farm, etc. in three years, and I couldn't see how that was going to happen, the way he was going. We do say now, actually, that it has done him a favour, because it stopped him, and he's starting again slowly. Jill's been fantastic. I mean, I'm bound to say that, aren't I? But she really has. The first thing I noticed, and this sounds as though he's a house husband, but I promise you he's not. I, I'd been out and I came in and he was just doing the washing up and it was wonderful. And I didn't realise how long he hadn't done anything like that for. And I remember a really warm feeling thinking, wow, you know, he's actually doing that. Because he just sat here while I got the milk, got the papers, got the logs, lit the fire. Which isn't Lynn, you know, it's just not. Eight months after his collapse, Lynn and Jill are in the process of moving to the local village. Retirement has come three years early. They have a new house and a new start. He's talked about when we move, he'll stop taking his tablets, which the doctor wants him to do, but he hasn't felt ready to do. But, you know, just the last few days he said, I think I will. So it's all really positive stuff, yeah. moment we've got so many places to go to and so much time to make up and be a little bit irresponsible perhaps you know come home late at night for not a change come home at all. or not come home at all Jill's got some <laughs> Jill's got plans which I better not divulge um now it's gonna be great it's gonna be great fun um we've got we've never sort of lived in a village or anything there's several societies and such we think that we can probably get into and just get mm. a different life mm. Turn off the old one. Mm. Just going to be the next chapter. Yeah. Linda has reluctantly come to accept that she will never go back to work, but it has left a large hole in her life. There was a huge multiplicity of roles in my life three years ago. Mum, there isn't now. It's very, very, very different. I'm a housewife. That's it. I've never been just a housewife, ever, ever before. Days are very much about getting up, going to the shop, getting me newspaper, doing the crossword, fiddling around in the garden, playing with the animals, sorting them out, making sure they're fed and watered, there's food in the cupboard for the kids. That's it, really. Deciding to die, I suppose it's the last taboo to be broken. Once you've done it and have lived, you know that you can always do it again. So not doing it is probably more out of respect for the people around you than because one has a burning desire to be alive. I 
like that. Oh, no. What can I get you? Just a mixer, please. A mixer, mixer, mixer. Because Five years more? since he left yep. the city, Justin has completely transformed his life. He is his own boss, and his career as a builder is going well. Every angle of it is different. It used to be a very sedentary lifestyle. This was more out here. Um, and I, you know, I sat at a desk for 10 or 12 hours a day, looked at computer screens and, and uh, you know, got up to have lunch and sat back down again. And now I sit down to have lunch and I stand up for the rest of the day. And at the end of the day, I feel, you know, physically exhausted. But it's a great feeling. I mean, that's a lovely feeling. I would be lying if I was to say to you that I now have a, a stress-free lifestyle. I don't but I have a good lifestyle and I really, really enjoy what I do. Now, in complete contrast to before, I, I look forward on Friday night to Monday. I want to get back to work again. In a way, I have two days now, whereas before my day was work and then sleep. Now I have work and then I have you know, the rest of the day, which might mean, you know, down in the pub or whatever, um, and then sleep. But there's a whole different segment in my life which almost didn't exist before. I've definitely made the right decision. You know, I think there are opportunities in the world which enable you to be more in control of yourself and, and how you run things and how you do things, and that's what I've achieved. So I'm, I'm very pleased. I saw an advert in the parish magazine which said professional opera singer seeks dedicated students and I thought well dare I. I hadn't sung since I was at school. Um, I thought well you know I've probably got an absolutely lousy voice but I'll, I'll work at it and I want I really wanted to do it. Uh, I was I, it seemed a way of, of uh, being able to express these emotions and I was feeling a lot of emotions. <laughs> Eleanor in her old phase would have ended wanted to sing at Covent Garden. I mean she wouldn't have stopped for anything settled for anything less. But she must have a wonderful singing teacher who again enabled her to find her voice, didn't judge it. And I've never heard Eleanor sing. I don't know how she's how, what her voice is like. And I, I it doesn't really matter, it's her voice. My husband Come still on. says, you know, I wish we could have a foreign holiday more Come often, on. but that's become oh, far less important for me. It's, it's as if you can live every day rather than waiting for the holidays or waiting for the weekend. Hey! Come! Heel. Heel. Come. With the support of friends, family, counsellor, doctor. Death. Not necessarily drugs, you know. I think everybody can find a way through.